So, but this question you should have an idea. So, so far, when we talk about dynamics, what I mean in general, as you see, is things evolving in time. That's what dynamics means. So dynamical systems means studying things that evolve in time. So for game theory and other things like that, we have you know, payoff functions, um, other things in physics like electromagnetic fields and things, these all have clear time evolutions. Right? Even in biology, you have populations that evolve in time. But in, in our universe, in cosmology, it's not so simple. And the reason is the following. So let me ask you, how many dimensions do we live in right now? Not string theories. In general, how many dimensions do we have? Four. So what are those four dimensions? So the claim is that we live in four dimensions, three space, one. But we don't just live in space, and we don't just live in time. We live in space-time, so it's four dimensions. So it's not just space, it's actually called space-time. And this was actually not Einstein's original idea. It was actually due to, if you can believe it, Poincaré again. And related to Poincaré was, does anybody know? That's not a Greek fellow. He was Minkowski. And then Einstein. Yeah, Einstein. And then Einstein kind of took their ideas and put it forward. But the idea is that you cannot separate space and time. They're one entity. So if, if you want to picture our universe as a four-dimensional manifold, then any event in our universe is labeled by four coordinates, x1, x2, x3, and then a time coordinate. So it's space-time. The point is you cannot separate these two. They are on equal footings. That gives you a problem when you're trying to understand dynamics, because then what does it mean for something to evolve in time? You see the problem. So the way you do this, and our universe, we want to understand the dynamics of our entire universe, how it's evolving. It's a problem because it's space-time. So how do you talk about something evolving in time? Well, what you do is, and I'm skipping about two months of general relativity lectures here, but what you do is you take your four-dimensional universe, and you apply what is called a foliage. And what this foliation does is, it takes four dimensions and splits it into three plus one. And so three spatial coordinates and one time. So in other words, you take a four dimensional structure and you break it up with the preferred timeline structure. I won't put this over here. And you have a bunch of three dimensional slices that you are evolving in time. So this would be a three-dimensional slice at time t is equal to zero, t is equal to one, t is equal to one. So now your dynamics of the universe are about three-dimensional surfaces evolving in time. And this is because of this three plus one split. So in here, this is governed by the Einstein field equations which you don't have to know, I'm just writing it for completeness. And the main point is that on the left side of these equations, you have curvature terms. And on the right side, this TAB is a matter. So the idea is that you have matter in the universe, like physical matter, like radiation, dust, etc that induces curvature in the space -time. In the 3 plus 1 picture, you have curvature that's evolving in time. So that's how you talk about dynamics. Okay. So, but this is, these are four-dimensional equations. How do these translate over to a dynamical model? So the idea is to, to 
Kinja dynamics. There are many ways. This is not a unique way to go from this picture to this picture. It's a convenient way to do it. To get dynamics, what you use is something called the orthonormal frame formula. And I will not also go into this in too much detail because I don't want people to start throwing things at me. But the idea behind this is that if you assume that on large scales, the universe is what we call spatially homogeneous. I'll explain what this means in a second. Then the Einstein field equations can be written as a nonlinear system of first order ordinary differentiation at dynamic. Does anybody know what I mean by spatially homogeneous? Yes. That everything looks the same from everywhere. Yeah. Almost. So it's isotropic. What do I mean by homogeneous? So I mean, that's a good point. So when I say something is spatially homogeneous, I mean that it's translationally invariant. So if I have something like this, like a circle or a sphere, and I take two points, and I move the two points, the sphere still stays the same. So I can translate, so this is invariant with respect to spatial transition. So on our largest scales, our universe is invariant with respect to spatial transition. It's homogeneous, and it's isotropic as well, but that's for another day. Okay, so the main point is the following. You can take these tensor equations that are actually 10 nonlinear, coupled, hyperbolic, partial differential equations that have no solution whatsoever. And you can reduce them to a dynamical system if you assume that the universe is spatially homogeneous on that. Because you see, if I tell you that the only thing that's evolving is time, that's what it means to be spatially homogeneous. Nothing is changing in space, it's only changing time. Yes, two questions. The first okay. one, uh, did Einstein actually do this equation himself? Yes. Like Under 10 years. 10 years? 10, 1905 to 1960. So then he, he didn't know how to solve this, but he interpreted it? So there's a, there's a funny joke behind this. Um, Einstein, in the process of 10 years of deriving these equations, spent many years going to talks where he was giving people kind of previews of what he was trying to do. And in one of his latest talks uh, around the 1915 mark, David Gilbert was sitting in the audience. Gilbert figured it out what Einstein was getting at. And Einstein knew that Gilbert knew what he was going to do. So he rushed home and they had a race between the two of them, actually. Gilbert figured out what Einstein was trying to do in 10 years in one hour. That's how smart David Gilbert was. So he figured out these equations. They are his equations. But then he concluded in this paper, except for the most trivial cases, these equations cannot be solved. Lo and behold, two years later, Schwarzschild comes up with a solution of these equations. So they're extremely complicated to solve. But you can do this, and you can get a dynamic system. Second question. Yes. So you said uh, about the, uh, for the uh, sphere one, the sphere oh. one the moon, they're the same? The sphere so doesn't the, change. So uh, what, is, what is that just for reality? If I take any two points in space, do I move them anywhere? The universe is on the largest scale. So if you see a picture of the cosmic microwave background, for example, you can take any two points in the night sky, but the universe doesn't change its structure with respect to rotations or translations of those points. That's so. So our universe is a very geometrically special. But, okay, so but what are these equations? 
So, when you apply this formula, as I said, the field equations become a dynamic system. So you get three equations. The first equation has a special name for it because it was derived by an Indian physicist for a change. His name was Ray Chaudhry. And his equation is called Ray Chaudhry's equation. And I'm not saying this because I'm obviously biased. I'm just saying that it is actually the most important equation in cosmology. I will say that. Okay. There are many non-Indians that will agree with me on this. Okay. And it goes like this. So you get theta prime. I'll explain what these variables are. So prime means d by dt, as usual, okay. is equal to minus one third theta squared minus one half mu plus b t plus capital R. I'll explain these in a second. I just want to write down these. So you get Ray Chaudhry's equation. You get what is known as the Friedman equation. Or constraint. And that looks like the following. So one third theta squared is equal to minus one half capital R plus mu plus lambda. You get an energy conservation equation.
It is one of the fundamental constants of nature, of our universe. Does anybody know what it is, the number? Oh. You don't have an idea? It's not five. It's actually a very small number. It's 10 to the minus 122. About. The cosmological constant represents what we call dark energy. Well, that's the belief anyway. And dark energy is responsible for the accelerated expansion. Yes. So Einstein. Right. So uh, Einstein. So this lambda here, this capital lambda, is responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe, the dark energy. Einstein introduced it into his equations by accident and thought it was a mistake at first. But then it was later on discovered that actually you need this. So it was his biggest blunder, as he said, but the most useful one. So is that clear so far? So one covers the expansion of the universe. You have things that talk about the matter and pressure of the universe. R is the curvature, and lambda is cosmology. Okay. So but as we've been doing with everything else, we have a constraint. So I can use the constraint to eliminate one of the variables. It's the same thing. There's nothing. Actually, this is, in some sense, more easy to deal with than the biological systems because. As of now, as you'll see, we only really have one free parameter. In the SRS model, we have like seven of no them. But it's much easier. So let me do that first. And there's a hidden surprise when you use a dynamical system method like this, and I'll tell you. So, can anybody quickly look? I erased the theta prime equation now. But just like in dynamical systems, I need one equation for every variable to have a closed system, right? I have not accounted for one variable. I'm missing one equation. Can anybody tell me what it is? Look carefully. Do I have an equation for theta? Do I have an equation for mu? Do I have an equation for R? Lambda is a constant, so whatever. What am I missing? Pressure. How do I take care of that? Any, any fluid mechanics people in here? Do you know? From atmosphere? No? No, I don't want to. Does anybody have an idea? How I can talk about pressure? I'm missing pressure. No. Okay. So, there's an assumption, <coughs> which is actually a pretty good assumption. We can assume that the matter in the universe is what we call barotropic. That means that the <coughs> pressure is proportional to the energy. And this, how do I change a proportionality to an equation? I have to introduce what? Constant, right. So to fix this, I will assume that P, which is the pressure, is given by some constant W. And that will allow me to close the equation. And in particular, what is this W? We call it an equation of state. And if you take courses in fluid mechanics, you will see this. Equation of state pressure. And this W, which is a dimensionless number, describes the type of matter you could have in the universe. In particular, we assume that W strictly is between minus 1 and 1. And there are some examples of what values of W can be. So, In particular, so some examples, if W is equal to zero, that means your universe is filled with dust, just straight old cosmic dust. If W is equal to minus one, this means you have a second 
cosmological constant, which is quite possible. If W is equal to one third, it means your universe is filled with radiation. There are some more exotic states. Um, if W is equal to minus one third, these are what you call cosmic strings. And the most extreme case on the other end is that W is equal to 1. This is what we call a Zeldovich group or a stiff group. So this is valid at very early times in the end. So now we have accounted for. And this is the only free parameter that will show up in our equation, this W. So now we have accounted for all the variables. Now I will use the constraint to eliminate the normal equation. This is all fluid mechanics theory. As I said, I'm skipping about three textbooks worth of courses for this 30 minutes. <laughs> um, but it's OK. We want to understand using what we know. So. I will now use the Friedman equation to eliminate mu just by choice. I don't like mu, I will eliminate. And as a result, you get two equations. So the Rayfeldian equation becomes the following: one fourth minus r minus 3rw, minus 2 theta squared, minus 2w theta squared, plus 6 lambda, plus 6w lambda. And the r prime equation is so simple, it's laughable, actually. And you don't expect it, actually. Watch how simple it is. It's minus 2 thirds of r theta. It's such a surprise when you derive it, and this just comes up as one term. So just like our other examples, the entire evolution of the universe on the larger scales comes down to two ordinary differentials. I skipped a lot of stuff, obviously, but this is the answer that we're using. Any questions? So that's our dynamical system, and it has one free parameter, which is the W. So you can tell now stability will depend on what W is. And I should make this point that you can have mixes of these two. So you can have intermediary states like four thirds, which is like radiation plus dust or something like that. You can have mixes. Okay, so that's our dynamical system. So now what is the first step when we begin? Because I don't believe that these can be solved. I tried it, not doesn't work. So what is the first step? Equivalent. So let's see what else. And I 
half lamb, there are three equilibrium functions. And this is the surprise about this method. So when I told you before that the Einstein equations are impossible to find closed form solutions for, it turns out actually, unlike our previous example, the equilibrium point actually means something very significant to this dynamic. And in fact, the surprise is that the equilibrium points are solutions to the Einstein equation. They just aren't random points, like in biology and game theory and stuff. They actually are solutions to the field. So in some sense, there are new ways to find solutions to Einstein equation. Using this orthonormal frame formalism. So what are they? So one equilibrium point, so I call this equilibrium point one, or just P1 maybe for short. So as I said, the simplest thing to do is to just set in turn theta to zero and one to zero and see what happens. So if you set theta to zero, so remember I'll call it theta star or star. So set theta to zero, and then you solve the R equation, what do you get? You get 6 lambda plus w lambda over 1 plus 3. So. Now, let me ask you, what is significant about this solution? What does it mean to have theta equal to 0? No, theta is equal to 0. Exactly. That's the key point. And so if it's something is not expanding or contracting, what is it by definition? Static. Static, Static that's right. Very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so theta is equal to zero. Remember, theta is the rate of expansion and scalar. So if it's not expanding, it's static. So the first set of equilibrium points represent static equilibrium. And now, it depends on the sign of R, how you subclass these static numbers. So, let me ask you a geometry question. If I have something that is spatially homogeneous, and actually I also made another assumption, which Spiros alluded to, but I actually didn't admit it at the time. Not only am I assuming Spatial invariance, but I'm also assuming rotational invariance. So, if I have some shape, easy geometry question. If I have some shape and it's invariant with respect to spatial translation and spatial rotation, what are the only three possible geometries I can? Spheres in three dimensions. Oh. So, what are the only possible three dimensional geometries that you can have? Planar. Sphere is one, planar is another. Hyperbolic. Perfect. Why did you say hyperbolic? Okay. <laughs> right. There's only three possibilities you can have a sphere or spherical geometry. You can have a hyperbolic geometry, which is like a saddle. Do not get confused, I don't mean the same hyperbolic as equilibrium. Or you can have a plane of here. Only three possible. In the first case now, is the curvature positive, negative, or zero? First sphere. Positive. So R would be greater. For a hyperbola or a saddle, is my curvature negative, positive, or zero? And for plane, is it flat? Yes, both. So not only 
do the first set of equilibrium points represent static universes. So if you have a subclass now, depending on the sign of this. So for point one, if R star is greater than zero, these are static spherical universes. If R star is less than zero, these are static hyperbolic universes or negative recursive universes. And if R star is equal to zero, you have static flat universes or just plain old Minkowski space time of special static and flat. Now, what is the only free parameter in R star? W. And W goes between minus 1 and 1. So depending on the sign of that, or the sign of W, we will have these types of things. So let's see what we have. And in fact, the case where R star is greater than 0, and it's static, this has a special name. It's called the Einstein static. Yes, yes, so I, I was doing the closed case, but I wrote the wrong sign. Now, the second case, R star less than zero. So, when do we have static hyperbolic universes? Is when 6 lambda plus w lambda, 1 plus 3 w is less than zero. And this is kind of more or less the opposite. Right? So, in this way, this will only happen when w is strictly between minus 1 and minus one. You'll get that. And the final case, you'll have a Minkowski or flat universe is what? See? Did you see that? Did you see that? Oh, okay. And R star is equal to zero if this is equal to zero, and that will only happen in the extreme case when W is minus. This is a minus one, not a minus one can both. Perhaps the W is equal to minus one third. Ah, you have singularities. But I do not want to talk about this at this juncture. Because I can feel the tension in this room right now. I do not want to. Actually, 
actually, it's a very important case. What you brought up, you see the curvature goes up, goes to infinity. So that's an example of a cosmological singularity. We talked about that. Okay. But is everybody clear on this? So it's the same thing. It's actually easier than the biology example. I have my dynamical system. I found the equilibrium point. And now I just look at the sign to see what I have. And the sign depends on the front. Okay, that's the first set of equilibrium points. In one minute, I think I can tell you the second set. Because really, there's one equilibrium. So these set of equilibrium points happen when I set theta to zero. Let me do the other one, now set r to zero. Equilibrium point. No, I have to do no one I was going to do I thought I'd have time, but I did not. Probably you asked me how to No, I just I, I thought I'd have time. Okay. So now we will set R to zero. And what does it mean if I'm starting only with solutions of R to zero? What type of points are these? So uh, I've not set theta to zero, just set r to zero. So they're flat. So these are flat. To be proper, I should say spatially flat. Because I criticize other people when they do not put spatially, so I should do it. And what happens is you get the following equilibrium point. Theta star, r star. If you set r to zero in that equation, and you solve for theta, you get the following. Very easy. Square root of 3, square root of 1, and theta. And actually, we can write down the second one as well, because it's just the minus of this. So it's positive. So there's three equilibrium points in total. The Einstein static universes and these flat universes. And these are also solutions to the field equations as well. In fact, these are what we call decision. And now you see theta is not zero, it has a number. If it's plus, so theta is equal to plus square root of 3 square root of lambda, these are expanding. I'll just put ds for this. And obviously if theta is equal to minus root 3 root of lambda, these are contracting. And I literally mean this, so if you have two observers in these universes that are moving in this universe, when I say they're expanding, I literally mean they're expanding apart. So one goes like that, and one goes like that. And the rate of this divergence is what you call theta. But you can go the other way too. So you can start, if the universe is contracting, as these observers are moving along these lines, they will eventually reach the same. One second, I'll get you. Okay. So these are the three equilibrium points. Now, which I must say for Wednesday, what is now the next step? So we will now analyze now, based on the eigenvalue, which of these points are stable, unstable. That's what we call it. Any questions? It's the same thing. Also. But this is much, much more interesting than anything biology does. I know. <laughs> I